Section 12 of The Magic of the Horseshoe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Doc D. L. Martin. The Magic of the Horseshoe by Robert Means Lawrence. Days of Good and Evil Omen. Part 1. Friday's moon, come when it will, it comes too soon. Proverb 1. Egyptian Days The belief in lucky and unlucky days appears to have been first taught by the magicians of ancient Chaldea, and we learn from history that similar notions affected every detail of primitive Babylonian life thousands of years before Christ. Reference to an unlucky month is to be found in a list of deprecatory incantations contained in a document from the library of the royal palace at Nineveh. This document is written in the Akkadian dialect of the Turanian language, which was akin to that spoken in the region of the lower Euphrates, a language already obsolete and unintelligible to the Assyrians of the 7th century B.C., Certain days were called Dias Egyptiaki because they were thought to have been pronounced unlucky by the astrologers of ancient Egypt. In that country, the unlucky days were, however, fewer in number than the fortunate ones, and they also differed in the degree of their ill luck. Thus, while some were markedly ominous, others merely threatened misfortune, and still others were of mixed augury, partly good and partly evil. There were certain days upon which absolute idleness was enjoined upon the people, when they were expected to sit quietly at home, indulging in dolce far niente. The poet Hesiod, who is believed to have flourished about 1,000 years B.C. in the third book of his poem, Works and Days, which is indeed a kind of metrical almanac, distinguishes lucky days from others and gives advice to farmers regarding the most favorable days for the various operations of agriculture. Thus, he recommends the eleventh of the month as excellent for reaping corn, and the twelfth for shearing sheep. But the thirteenth was an unlucky day for sowing, though favorable for planting. The fifth of each month was an especially unfortunate day, while the thirtieth was the most propitious of all. Some of the most intelligent and learned Greeks were very punctilious in their observance of Egyptian days. The philosopher Proclus, A.D. 412 to 485, was said to be even more scrupulous in this regard than the Egyptians themselves, and Plotinus, A.D. 204 to 270, another eminent Grecian philosopher, believed with the astrologers of a later day that the positions of the planets in the heavens exerted an influence over human affairs. In an ancient calendar of the year 334, in the reign of Constantine the Great, 26 Egyptian days were designated. At an early period, however, the church authorities forbade the superstitious observance of these days. Some of the most eminent early writers of the Christian church, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, and St. Chrysostom were earnest in their denunciation of the prevalent custom of regulating the affairs of life by reference to the supposed omens of the calendar. The Fourth Council of Carthage in 398 censored such practices, and the Synod of Rouen in the reign of Clovis anathematized those who placed faith in such relics of paganism. We learn on the authority of Marco Polo that the Brahmins of the province of Luristan in southern Persia in the 13th century were extremely punctilious in their choice of suitable days for the performance of any business matters. This famous traveler wrote that a Brahmin who contemplated making a purchase, for example, would measure the length of his own shadow in the early morning sunlight, and if the shadow were of the proper length, as officially prescribed for that day, he would proceed to make the purchase. 
Otherwise, he would wait until the shadow conformed in length to a predetermined standard for that day of the week. The Latin historian Rolandino, 1200-76, in the third book of his chronicle, describes an undertaking which resulted disastrously because, as was alleged, it was rashly begun on an Egyptian day. There is frequent mention of these days in many ancient manuscripts in the Ambrosian Library at Milan. In a so-called Book of Precedents, printed in 1616, 53 days are specified as being, such as the Egyptians, noted to be dangerous to begin or take anything in hand, or to take a journey, or any such thing. An ancient manuscript mentions 28 days in the year which were revealed by the angel Gabriel to good Joseph, which ever have been remarked to be very fortunate days either to let blood, cure wounds, use merchandises, sow seed, build houses, or take journeys. Astrologers formally specified particular days when it was dangerous for physicians to bleed patients, and especially to be avoided were the first Monday in April, on which day Cain was born and his brother Abel slain, the first Monday in August, the alleged anniversary of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and the last Monday in December, which was the reputed birthday of Judas Iscariot. In Mason's Anatomy of Sorcery, 1612, the prevailing notions on this subject were characterized as vain speculations of the astrologers, having neither foundation in God's word nor yet natural reason to support them, but being grounded only upon the superstitious imagination of men. A work of 1620 entitled Melton's Astrologaster says that the Christian faith is violated when, like a pagan and apostate, any man doth observe those days which are called Egyptiaki, or the calends of January, or any month, day, time, or year, either to travel, marry, or do anything in. And the learned Sir Thomas Brown in his Pseudodoxia Epidemica, published in 1658, declaimed in quaint but forcible language against the frivolity of such doctrines. 2. Roman Superstition Concerning Days The Romans had their dies fasti, corresponding to the modern court days in England. On such days, of which there were thirty-eight in the year, it was lawful for the praetor to administer justice and to pronounce the three words, Do, Dico, Adico. I give laws, declare right, and adjudge losses. The days on which the courts were not held were called Nefasti, from Ne and Fari, because the three words could not then be legally spoken by the praetor. But these days came to be regarded as unlucky, a fact rendered evident by an expression of Horace. The Romans also classed as unfortunate the days immediately following the calends, nuns, and ides of each month. Unlucky days were termed dies atri because they were marked in the calendar with black charcoal, the lucky ones being indicated by means of white chalk. There were also days which were thought especially favorable for martial operations, but the anniversary of a national misfortune was considered very inauspicious. Thus, after the defeat of the Romans by the Gauls under Brennus on the banks of the river Alia, July 16, 390 BC, that date was given a prominent place among the black days of the calendar. But not every general was influenced by such superstitions. Lucullus, when an attempt was made to dissuade him from attacking Tigranes, king of Armenia, whom he defeated B.C. 69, because upon that date the Cimbri had vanquished a Roman army, replied, I will make it a day of good omen for the Romans. The Roman ladies, we are told, gave less heed to the unlucky days of their own calendar than to the works of Egyptian astrologers, among whom Petasiris was their favorite authority. When they wished to ascertain the proper day and even the hour for the performance of household and other duties. Horace, Book 2, Ode 13, thus apostrophizes a tree, 
by whose fall he narrowly escaped being crushed at Sabinum. Thou cursed tree, whoever he was that first planted thee, did it surely on an unlucky day, and with a sacrilegious hand. The Latin writer Macrobius stated that when one of the Nundine, or market days, fell upon New Year's, it was considered very unfortunate. In such an event, the emperor Augustus, who was very superstitious, adopted the method of inserting an extra day in the previous year and subtracting one from that ensuing, thus preserving the regularity of the Julian style of reckoning time. Ordinarily, however, New Year's Day was deemed auspicious, and on that day, as now, people were accustomed to wish each other happiness and good fortune. 3 medieval belief in day fatality the early saxons in england were extremely credulous in regard to the luck or misfortune of particular days of the month and derived a legion of prognostics both good and evil from the age of the moon thus they considered the twelfth day of the lunar month a profitable one for sowing getting married travelling and bloodletting but the thirteenth day was in bad repute among the saxons an evil day for undertaking any work the fourteenth was good for all purposes for buying serfs marrying and putting children to school whereas the sixteenth was profitable for nothing but thieving the twenty-second was a proper time for buying villains or agricultural bondmen and a boy born on that day would become a physician the twenty-fifth was good for hunting and a girl then born would be of a greedy disposition and a wool-teaser in an english manuscript of the twelfth century mentioned in chambers book of days and known as the exeter calendar new year's is set down as a dies mala as an illustration of the credulity prevalent in england in the fifteenth century regarding the influences meteorological and moral of the occurrence of important church festivals on particular days of the week a few lines from a manuscript of the harleian collection in the british museum are here quoted lordlings all of you i warn if the day that christ was born fell upon a sunday the winter shall be good, I say, but great winds aloft shall be. The summer shall be fair and dry, by kind skill and without loss. Through all lands there shall be peace, good time for all things to be done, but he that stealeth shall be found soon. What child that day born may be, a great lord he shall live to be. Not alone in Britain, but throughout the world men have esteemed one day above another this universal tendency of the human mind is tersely expressed in a translation by barnaby googe of some verses accredited to the bavarian theologian thomas kirchmeyer fifteen eleven to seventy eight whose literary pseudonym was neogorgas and first betwixt the days they make no little difference for all be not of virtue like nor like preeminence but some of them egyptian are and full of jeopardy and some again beside the rest both good and lucky be like difference of the nights they make as if the almighty king that made them all not gracious were to them in everything john gall in his magastromancer sixteen fifty two remarks that according to the teachings of the astrologers times can give a certain fortune to our business the magicians likewise have observed and all the antient verse men consent in this that it is of very great concernment in what moment of time and disposition of the heavens everything whether natural or artificial hath received its being in this world for they have delivered that the first moment hath so great power that all the course of fortune dependeth thereon and may be foretold thereby in the dark ages and also in early modern times the false doctrines of astrology an inheritance from the ancients dominated the actions of men in all important enterprises as well as in everyday labors it was deemed essential to make a beginning under the influence of a favorable planet 
nor did these beliefs prevail exclusively among ignorant people, but were as well a part of the creed of scholars and of the nobility and gentry. Modern astronomical discoveries, and especially the Copernican system, availed to banish a vast amount of superstition regarding the malevolent character of certain days. But neither science nor religion have yet been able wholly to eradicate it, as is evident from the ill repute associated with the sixth day of the week even at the present time, a subject to be considered later. In the Loseley Manuscripts, edited by Alfred John Kemp, London, 1836, is to be found a letter, some extracts from which may serve to illustrate the paramount influence of astrology in England in the 16th century. The letter is addressed to Mr. George Moore at Thorpe. As for my coming to you upon Wednesday next, I cannot possibly be with you till Thursday. On Friday and Saturday, the sign will be in the heart. On Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, in the stomach, during which time it will be no good dealing with your ordinary physique until Wednesday comes seven night at the nearest, and from that time forwards for fifteen or sixteen days passing good, in which time, if it will please you to let me understand of your convenient opportunity and season, I will not fail to come along presently with your messenger, your worship's assured loving friend, Simon Tripp. M. D. Winton, September eighteenth, fifteen eighty one. The influence of the position of the moon in determining the proper seasons for surgical operations and for the administration of medicines may be best illustrated by a few extracts from ancient almanacs. An antique illustrated manuscript almanac for the year thirteen eighty six contains the following advice to physicians in a new moon shall not be letting of blood for yon are many's bodies void of blood and humus and yon by letting of blood shall you be more annoyed and again it is to know generally if the time elect to give a medicine is when the moon and the lord ascending are free from all ill and not let by it and it is highly to beware to a medicine while the moon is in an ill aspect with Saturn or Mars. An almanac for the year 1568, published by John Securus, London, contains a list of days in that year favorable or otherwise for the preservation of man's health. The second day of January was therein declared to be wholly propitious, the twelfth was unfavorable owing to the furious aspect of mars to the sun which was not however likely to cause bodily sickness but rather to incline the hearts of some people to imagine evil of their rulers the fifteenth of april was especially to be dreaded on that day says the writer god keep us from the fury of mars in june evil passions were to stir men's hearts anger hatred and strife for in that month were no less than six quartile aspects of the planets one to another. Many propitious days are also mentioned, and in conclusion all days are declared to be favorable to a good man. A new almanac and prognostication for the year of our Lord God, 1569, London, says that surgical operations must be performed only when the moon or lord of the first house is in the zodiacal sign governing the particular member or organ which is to be operated upon and in an english almanac for the year fifteen seventy one we find the following passage no part of man's body ought to be touched with the surgical instruments or cautery actual or potential when the sun or moon or the lord of the ascendant is in the same sign that ruleth that part of man's body also gemini leo the last half of libra and the first twelve degrees of scorpio with taurus virgo and capricorn are not good for the letting of blood two days before the change of the moon and a day after is ill to let blood if the same be for the pestilence, the frenzy, the pleurisy, the squincy, or for a continual headache, proceeding of collar or blood, or for any burning ague or extreme pain of parts, 
A man may not so carefully stay for a chosen day by the almanac, for that, in the meantime, the patient perhaps may die. For which cause, let the skillful surgeon open a vein, unless he find the patient very weak, or that the moon be in the same sign that governeth that part of man's body. The persistence of similar beliefs is shown by the following extract from a brief prognosticon, or rather diagnosticon, for this year of grace, 1615, by John Keane, London. Seeing that these inferior and sublunary mixed bodies are governed of the superior and simple bodies, and especially by the motion of our neighbor planet, the moon, diseases vary and differ, and not for that she exceeds the rest in virtue and power, but because she is nearer us and swifter in motion. For we see the moon increasing, humors increase, and when she decreaseth, humors decrease. For the bones in the full of the moon are full of marrow. All living creatures, both on sea and land, are then augmented in humidity, as the crab, lobster, oyster, etc., also humors in man's body and in plants are then increased, for when the sun and moon are in hot signs, heat is increased. In cold signs, cold exceeds heat. Therefore have we just cause in purging of humors to consider the motion of the moon through every sign of the zodiac, not only in purging of humors, but also in curing diseases and in strengthening the faculties and virtues. In the Dialogue of Dives and Popper, printed by Richard Pinson in 1493, this subject is referred to as follows. All that take heed to dismal days, or use nice observances in the new moon or in the new year, as setting of meat or drink by night on the bench to feed all hold or goblin. The French traveler Jean Chardin, 1643 to 1713, stated that in the year 1668, Cossacks invaded the northern provinces of Persia, and when the inhabitants appealed to the Persian government for aid, they received only the reply that no assistance could be sent them until the moon had passed out of the sign of the scorpion. The Persians formerly divided all the days of the year into three classes, preferable or lucky, middling or indifferent, and unlucky or detested ones, and the Emperor Frederick the Great of Prussia, 1712-86, to 86, was governed in his military operations by the advice of astrologers, and always waited until they had indicated the fortunate moment for a start. The English Apollo by Richard Saunders, student in the divine, laudable, and celestial sciences, London, 1656, in giving advice to mariners, says that the good or bad position of the planets at the time of sailing has much influence over the fortunes of a voyage. The ancient sages, moreover, declared that the chief means of averting evil were first the devout invocation of providence, and secondly, the careful choice of a proper time for sailing by observation of the rules of astrology. In William Jones's Credulities Past and Present, 1525, St. Augustine is quoted as follows. No man shall observe by the days on what day he travel, or on what he return, because God created all the seven days which run in the week to the end of this world. But whithersoever he desires to go, let him sing and say his paternoster, if he know it, and call upon his Lord, and bless himself, and travel free from care under the protection of God, without the sorceries of the devil. Four. Prevalence of similar beliefs in modern times. Among the Chinese of today, as with the inhabitants of ancient Babylon, the days which are deemed favorable or otherwise for business transactions, farming operations, or for traveling are still determined by astrologers and are indicated in an official almanac published annually at Pekin by the Imperial Board of Astronomers. The various tribes of the island of Madagascar also are exceedingly superstitious in regard to the luck or ill luck attending certain days, and the lives of children born at an unlucky time are sometimes sacrificed to save them from anticipated misfortune. 
Natives of the Gold Coast of West Africa, in their divisions of the year, observe a long time, consisting of 19 lucky days, and a short time of seven equally propitious days. The seven days intervening between these two periods are considered unlucky, and during this time they undertake no voyages, nor warlike enterprises. Somewhat similar ideas prevail in Java and Sumatra, and in many of the smaller islands of the Malay archipelago, the Cossacks of western Siberia, the natives of the Baltic provinces of the Russian Empire, and the Laplanders of the far north all adapt their lives to the black and white days of their calendar. The peasantry of West Sussex in England will not permit their children to go blackberrying on the 10th day of October, on account of a belief that the devil goes afield on that day, and bad luck would surely befall anyone rash enough to eat fruit gathered under such circumstances. The same people believe that all cats born in the month of May are hypochondriacs, and have an unpleasant habit of bringing snakes and vipers into the house. Among the Moslems of India, there are in each month seven evil days on which no enterprise is to be undertaken on any consideration. Some of the peculiar superstitions of these people with regard to traveling on the different weekdays are shown in zanun e islam or the customs of the Muslims of India, by Jafar Sharif. Thus, if one proposes journeying on Saturday, he should eat fish before starting in order that his plan may be successfully accomplished. But on Sunday, beetle leaf is preferable for this purpose. In like manner, on Monday, he should look into a mirror in order to obtain wealth. On Tuesday, he should eat coriander seed, and on Wednesday should partake of curdled milk before starting. On Thursday, if he eat raw sugar, he may confidently anticipate returning with plenty of merchandise. And on Friday, if he eat dressed meat, he will bring back pearls and jewels galore. Some idea of the beliefs current in the mother country during the last century may be obtained by a study of the advertisements of astrologers and medical charlatans in the public press of that period. For example, in the year 1773, one Sylvester Partridge, proprietor and vendor of antidotes, elixirs, washes for freckles, plumpers for rounding the cheeks, glass eyes, calves and noses, ivory jaws, and a new receipt for changing the color of the hair, offered for a consideration to furnish advice as to the proper times and seasons for letting blood and to indicate the most favorable aspect of the moon for drawing teeth and cutting corns. He proffered counsel, moreover, as to the avoidance of unlucky days for paring the nails, and the kindest zodiacal sign for grafting, inoculation, and opening of beehives. In enlightened England, there are still to be found many people who believe that the relative positions of the sun, moon, and planets are prime factors in determining the proper times and seasons for undertaking terrestrial enterprises. Zadkiel's Almanac for 1898 states that natural astrology is making good progress towards becoming once more a recognized science. To quote from the preface of this publication, as the whole body of the ocean is not able to keep down one single particle of free air, which must assuredly force its way to the surface to unite with the atmosphere, so cannot the combined forces of the prejudice and studied contempt of all the soi disant, really scientific men, of the end of the century, prevent the truth of Astrologia Sana from soaring above their futile efforts to crush it down, to join the great atmosphere of natural science, to enlighten the human mind in its onward course and effort, to soar through nature up to nature's God. One example may suffice to exhibit the character of the predictions given in this same work. Under the caption, Voice of the Stars, August 1898, the writer says that the stationary positions of Saturn and Uranus are likely to shake Spain, and perhaps Tuscany, physically and politically, about the 10th or 11th institutions.
There will be strained diplomatic relations between the United States and Spain for Mars in the sign Gemini and Saturn in Sagittarius must create friction and disturbances in both countries. The Jewish current beliefs in the influence of certain days and seasons appear to have been mostly derived from the Romans of old. Even nowadays among the Jews, no marriages are solemnized during the interval of 50 days between the Feast of the Passover and Pentecost, and formerly the favorite wedding days were those of the new or full moon. In Siam, the 8th and 15th days of the moon are observed as sacred and devoted to worship and rest from ordinary labor. Sportsmen are forbidden to hunt or fish on these days. The Siamese astrologers indicate the probable character of any year by associating it with some animal upon whose back the new year is represented as being mounted. End of section 12